behalf of the Central Voting Bureau, it's with great pleasure that I extend a warm welcome to all of you gathered here at the Legislative Hall of the House of Parliament and all those joining us virtually through various platforms. We're here today for an important briefing to update you on the ongoing preparations for our parliamentary elections scheduled for this Thursday, January 11th, 2024. I wanna begin by expressing my appreciation for the representatives from the Civil Registry, GEBE, and KPSM who are with me here today. Their tireless and often unseen efforts play a fundamental role in ensuring the smooth functioning of our electoral process. The Civil Registry in particular has been instrumental in all aspects on our road towards Election Day. The collaboration and dedication of KPSM in supporting the security aspects of the elections are equally commendable and vital. The Central Voting Bureau is committed to upholding the integrity and efficiency of these elections. To date, we've validated the list of eight political parties, introducing 129 candidates aspiring for a place in Parliament. In addition to overseeing the ballot printing process, our preparations for the upcoming elections encompass a wide range of activities. All plan to ensure a smooth and trustworthy voting experience when the polls open at 8 a.m. on Thursday. The preparation of the polling stations is underway, with each, each location being equipped with the necessary materials and facilities to accommodate voters. This includes setting up secure ballot boxes, ensuring adequate privacy in the voting booths, and providing clear signage for voters. Another crucial part of our preparation has been the training of polling station members. These individuals have been trained in the electoral process, including the handling of ballots, managing voter flow, and ensuring adherence to voting protocols. This training is designed to equip them with the knowledge and skills needed to address any questions or concerns from voters on the day of the elections. In summary, every aspect of the election, from the ballots to the polling stations and the training of staff, is being carefully managed to ensure that we are fully prepared. Our goal is to provide a seamless and transparent process, inspiring confidence in the democratic system of St. Martin. We're committed to ensuring that every eligible voter can cast their vote with trust and integrity and efficiency of the electoral process. Furthermore, we're adapting to new changes this year. The legislated removal of the curtain from the voting booths is being implemented with careful consideration to ensure that the confidentiality of the voter's choice is maintained, while also adhering to contemporary standards of transparency and accessibility. We thank the relevant stakeholders for working together with us to ensure that these standards are met, while also protecting an individual's right to vote in secrecy. We will continue in the following days with our responsibilities in facilitating a fair and transparent election. The Central Voting Bureau remains committed to upholding the democratic principles that are the foundation of our society in St. Martin. We look forward to a successful election and appreciate the support and cooperation of the community in this essential democratic exercise. I would like to now give the floor to the representatives from the Civil Registry, NVGBE, and KPSM for any remarks that they may have to share with the public. Their input today will shed light on various aspects of the election process and the steps we've taken to ensure that everything runs smoothly this Thursday. After their statements, we'll open the floor to questions from the media. Thank you once again for being with us today. Your engagement is vital to our democratic process. Good morning, St. Martin. Sir Registry Department is ready for election. We have done all the necessary to ensure that the voters can vote on January 11, 2024. We started in October 2023 with updating the address of each person. We had walk-ins for the persons to come and check their address. After that, we had walk-ins for pickup of voting cards and ID cards. We had many Saturdays from October 7th till December 16th for walk-ins for ID cards. On December 3rd, sorry, on December 
November 24th, we started with distribution of voting cards until December 1st, 2023. There, 3,074 persons collected their voting card at the government administration building. On December 3rd, 2023, we delivered 19,479 voting cards to the post office. On December 27, 2023, we received 1,235 voting cards back from the post office. From January 3rd till January 6, 2024, we had walk-ins to collect voting cards. There, we issued 350 duplicates. These were not regular pickups from the voting cards that we received back. These were duplicates printed. From the ones that we got back from the post office, we had 28 that was collected from the cards. So right now, we have 1,207 cards to deliver. Unfortunately, we could not assist persons during this week because we had to engage ourselves in preparation for the election. So yesterday we had some persons come in to collect voting cards while that was not on our schedule to do such. Tomorrow, Wednesday, from 9, 8.30 a.m. till 12, we will have walk-in for pickup of voting cards. Don't forget, so registry has their regular working schedule as well. Please have patience with our staff. On Thursday, January 11, 2024, we will be open at the civil registry department only for voting purposes. So if someone needs to get a voting card, they can still come to the civil registry department for the voting card. Also, we will recommend everyone not to go to voting um, polling stations to get voting cards there. Please come to the government building until 6 p.m. If after 6 p.m. you were not able to get your voting card, you can go to the polling stations where the members can make a duplicate. The reason for us asking the voters not to go before to the polling station and ask duplicate is because it is a tedious work and it will hold up the lines and making a long line of waiting for you to cast your vote. So please, if possible, come tomorrow or Thursday during the day at the Civil Registry Department to get your voting card. We will be till, eight, till 6 p.m. open and the voting stations will be till 8, so between 6 and 8, they will provide a duplicate card at the polling stations. Hope to have informed you sufficient. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> On, um, with regards to NPGEBE, um, despite having load shedding, um, we experienced load shedding on Monday and perhaps a bit of today, um, GB anticipate that the electricity will be stable on Thursday because um, we are doing right now preventive maintenance and we had um, technical issues with one or two engines. We expect all those engines to be, be, up, be back up in operation by the end of business today, meaning that as of um, Thursday, uh, we expect stable and reliable electricity. We cannot foresee any mechanical issues, of course. Uh, my staff is totally um, 24 hours available. Um, in the event um, that might be any adverse um, activities, um, the cables for parliament building, government building, hospitals will never be pulled, so they will always have maintained electricity. But uh, moving forward, as of close of business today, we do not foresee any more load shedding. So on GB's, from GB's perspective, we expect reliable electricity. That's it. Uh, good morning. Um, 
as the police force of St. Martin, we are prepared to assist 100% um, in a smooth election um, 2024. Um, with this, I also need to put a focus on that day, there is not only election. So we will have the normal functioning of country St. Martin ongoing uh, with the example of uh, four uh, of the biggest cruise ships that visit us will be in port. So there will be a lot of movement and traffic um, on that day also with regards to the tourist uh, season that we are in. We are ready, as I said, but want to ask for all the cooperation we can get from the community on for us to have a smooth transition and a smooth uh, election day. And when I ask for cooperation, it's also mainly in traffic. We can support all the polling stations with officers that is regulated. Um, we are also asking um, party supporters to adhere to the conditions and the main one is not to create any disturbance in the police station and not to create um, any congestion. Um, and the rule of five meters away from the entrance of the polling station will be strictly maintained. Um, next to that, uh, on that day, the police force of St. Martin will not um, tolerate any form of disorder, um, public disorder on the street, et cetera. And it's obvious why we cannot do that on, on uh, 14 day with major operations um, from cruise ships and other operations that are still going on. So when it comes to traffic and congestion and the traffic rules, we will be strict. Thank you. Right, I'll, I'll look to my right and to my left. I think you don't have anything else to add to your previous remark. Yes? yes? Yes, okay, so I'll give Cathy one more uh, opportunity. I would like to remark that polling station 11 is Charles Leopold Bell School. Reason why I'm bringing this information forth is that some persons believe that Charles Leopold Bell School is not a polling station and they had questions so with this yes that is a polling station um, we are cleaning right now Fromi is assisting us with cleaning the premises so we have it function as a polling station also polling station number 16 in St. John on the voting cards the address states Apache um, lane and we had some questions so I want to inform the public of District 16 St. John um, Mac School that it is Independence Lane if they are seeking the address but just um, know that it's the Mac School in St. John. That's the address that we had from past that we always had on the voting cards, that's Apache Lane. And unfortunately, we understood after that the address changed to Independence Lane. Yes? A small clarification. Thank you, Cathy. And then um, for the members of the media seated across from us, so we will allow questions from you. So what we'll ask for you to do then is to hit the button on your mic and stand and then ask your question and then we'll address that. So I saw here the, the hand in the back, so I'll, I'll allow that one first if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, then uh, Phoebe Shaw from SMN News. Thank you, uh, good morning. I'd like some clarification um, from the civil registry. Um, 
I am yet to understand the mix up with the address because this is not the first election. How long have we been having this problem? And we've had a cleanup, you said, at the civil registry. Why not at least have your polling station address corrected and be correct on the polling, uh, on, the, on the voting cards? Besides that, for the 1,207 uh, voting cards, how many persons uh, the court mandated to be registered because there were some cases, there were people who were asking to get on the registry. Can you give us an update on that? The address for the school, we don't manage school address. So that's in the voting registry, it's not civil registry. So the address of a school that was wrong in our voting registry um, form for the polling station, it's not a, a wrong address in civil registry. We always had the um, Max School in St. John as a patchy lane in the voting registry. So we will make the, the correction from now and make sure that we have the correct building address for the uh, Max School in St. John. And it has from, I mean, I have done six election already on St. Martin and since then, it was Apache Road. It's the corps police call and ask me, um, persons within the community, CPO call and ask, where is Apache Lane? And they couldn't find it. So I, I find it um, in place to rectify it right here um, to the public. Also, with regards to the court, yesterday we had sitting um, for court request. Indeed, the court did not give all the verdict. We had um, 32 requests from persons that came after to register after the 23rd of October. Some persons was already registered. However, they were not Dutch. So there are the naturalization happened on the 15th of December, mm -hmm. but the naturalization happens um, retroactive to July. Some persons then is considered Dutch from July, mm -hmm. but they were not in the system. So I believe it was four that um, naturalized and were, were granted permission to be added to the voting um, registry that is from the Dutch citizens mm -hmm. that knew Dutch citizens. We had a few persons as well that um, they were registered after they came from different um, places. They were on the island, as you could read in the newspaper, there was two that um, were working already here and they could have proof, proof that they're working with, with slips and, and, and all kinds of proof that they submit to the judge. They are living on St. Martin, but they register after the 23rd. And we had some persons that were deregistered after that was denied as well by the judge. So in total right now, we had 11 that was approved and we are waiting for others. Also civil registry had some persons was deregistered based on um, the, the project that we are doing right now, we submitted the request ourselves for 15 persons. The judge agreed that he will um, approve all 15. We have also the prison, whereby we didn't have all the names of the, the inmates, and those will be also granted to have them all to vote at the district number 19 which is um, the prison. Thank you, Kathy. And my next question I'll ask Mr. Washington. Can you expound a little bit on exactly what was the cause of the load shedding? Was it lack of maintenance? What exactly was it? And how can you guarantee uh, stable electricity for Thursday? But yesterday, uh, all we're hearing, um, you know, it was not, nobody gave us an explanation exactly as to the reason for the load shedding. So what exactly caused it and what have you done or put in place to guarantee stable electricity for Thursday? And thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Misha. Um, I, I, like I just mentioned, um, 
GPs busy um, putting back the engines into service. Um, we were doing a preventive maintenance of one of our engines. Um, GB maintains a criteria of N minus two, meaning that two of your largest engines should be able to go down, and then you can be able to maintain capacity. However, when you're doing um, pre preventive maintenance and there are adversity, which um, you have dealing with mechanical engines, um, anything can happen. And because we've, we had some mechanical failures in the weekend, we had to take down one or two engines to fix those engines. And that's why you had those load shedding yesterday because we're focusing on engine number nine and number eight. Uh, engine number eight is back up. Today we are trying to find out like, engine number 15, which should be end of business. So once those engines are back up, then we should have a sufficient capacity to carry us through um, Thursday. Um, and on top of election day as well, we expect to have less load on that day, like schools will be out, et cetera, et cetera. So that will give us additional reserve in terms of capacity. So by means of that, and that also that if everything goes according to plan, there's no adversity, we do think we have sufficient capacity to carry the, whichever load is demanded on election day. Thank you. Thank you very much and a uh, very good morning and all the best for 2024 to everyone here. I do have several questions. The first one, I'm not sure um, which of the parties would be able to answer it, but I would like to get an indication as to what is the total cost of our election, of the 2024 election, and how will this cost be applied? Where will it be applied? Uh, paying people, setting up the various polling stations, can you give us an indication as to where that will be applied? And I will ask my next question after I get my answer. I think we, I don't, I'm not sure that any of us have that number off the top of our heads, but um, I think we're aware uh, to a certain extent on what types of, of figures we can think of, of course, based on our budget requests that, we, that we've put in. Um, from the Voting Bureau perspective, for example, it, it you know, you can think of figures where it comes to, you know, there was recently a law change when it came to the remuneration of the members of the, of the Central Voting Bureau, which means that this year it, they applied retroactive re, um, effect to that law, meaning that we also had to take into account in our budget the previous Central Voting Bureau. And, um, and then, of course, for us, you can think of costs such as, you know, food for, for the day to, to, you know, feed people in Parliament, DCOM, um, our members are themselves. We have a we have a, a whole calling station and individuals that we need to um, to feed there as well. Besides that, we also have to remunerate, of course, the polling station members um, for all 20 um, polling stations. Of course, we have the costs of the ballots, um, any costs that go into, you know, uh, if, for example, even when we're talking about the Charles Leopold Bell, I'm not sure in, in how far we've adequately budgeted for that, but you know, we've had to cut grass down, we've had to tow vehicles, we've, we, we will also have to to fix the doors, we'll have to fix the ceiling to make the the, the space um, adequate uh, for voting. Um, and I'm trying to think of some other numbers that I'm that. Uh, but the budget is from ISDEF. Yeah, Senate. Yes, yeah, so of course. Uh, that's uh, Kathy was just adding that it the budget for elections is all funder falls under the Ministry of General Affairs. So it's. It's all bu budgeted within there, uh, based on, of course, our requests. So we're given a portion that that we, you know, kind of maintain, and we do our best to uh, to really run a, a tight and efficient um, election with with very minimal resources, to be honest. And um, and that the same goes for for the civil registry. We're really kind of nickel and diming um, to get things done. But I I don't know if I, I don't. I'm not sure that I'm brave enough to throw out a number, but I have one in my head and you might have a better one, <laughs> so. Okay, every year, um, the General Affairs, Ministry of General Affairs, put an um, amount on the budget for election. Of course, it's not every year we have election, but we have to take that in consideration. I believe the total per year is 200,000 guilders we have on a budget reserve for election. Of course, if we don't use it, it will stay there until the year of election. Um, yes, there's quite some cost if you think on 100 persons for polling station and um, the, the ballots, as Ms. Tackling just said, we have all different little things that we have to add up, phones we have to arrange, all the polling stations, some of them cost uh, more money than others because we are thinking of 
um, places as um, Hope Estate, Butte Hotel, all those places we have to pay. It's not a free location. And um, I think you can sum up the four years that we, we have the budget that we use that type of amount for uh, election, more or less. Thank you so much for that clarity. And my second question, um, is anyone able to provide me any information as to, I know it was mentioned in an earlier press briefing, but I'm not sure if you will have that information, that a request was made for election observers. Um, are we, has that, is, any, is there any indication whether we will have election observers? How many are coming and which organizations specifically are they coming from? And you mentioned Ms. Snyder's 100 persons for polling station, am I to gather that the total number of persons who will be manning the various po polling stations is 100 persons. And my final question, um, I seem to have lost my train of thought. Thank you. So I think the first question was uh, pertaining to any election observers. We yes. were in contact with, um, with observers. We had you know, made budget available to be able to accommodate them with a lot of uh, a lot of effort. However, uh, in the end, for example, we had been contacted by uh, individuals in Canada wanting to uh, join us out of uh, Quebec. Um, unfortunately, with timing and the flights, they weren't able to uh, to make it. So we won't be having any international observers uh, uh, this election. Then, with respect to the question about the polling station members, that is correct. It is a hundred by law. Um, there are five members in each polling station, and we have twenty. So it would be a hundred. Sorry, I do remember my very last, very brief question, <laughs> and it's directed to um, Mr. Washington. You gave an explanation to my colleague as to um, what occurred to result in the uh, load shedding we've had over the past two days. When we received the notification from GB, it said that it was due to unforeseen circumstance. I just wanted to know, why not just explain ahead of time, be a little bit more transparent to the population when, you're, when these notifications are being issued, rather than giving these broad terminologies that does not indicate why exactly we have an outage. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I think I did mention that there were mechanical issues. And, and when I was just addressing Ms. Shah, so um, we, when we are dealing with emergencies, we, and we indicate to the public that there will be load shedding. But if I, we go and focus on the communication rather than the emergency, then I think we are we are not um, addressing the, the the problem at hand because the longer we take before we load shed, there's a huge risk of a blackout. So when we are having problems, it's a matter of seconds and minutes of a decision process rather than minutes. So maybe you say we can go a bit uh, more detail, but when there's a mechanical issue or emergency, you cannot foresee that. So if we come out and uh, we mention that there is an issue. I cannot foresee that tomorrow piston will break. Right. So when it happens, we say, okay, there's an issue, we're gonna do load shedding. So we're trying to make, we're trying to guarantee the neighborhoods with electricity rather than having a blackout. So then we go and load shed. To, so we say, okay, in each neighborhood we give 60 minutes with no electricity in order to give my staff necessary time for the engines to cool off. That's number one, it takes about six hours for the engine to cool down. And then after that, we can start repairing the engine. So it's not as a vehicle, you open the hood and you fix it. So I hope that answers your question. All right. Good morning. My question is for Ms. Tarkelin. Um, earlier on, you said that 129 persons will be in the running for the parliamentary seats. Um, can you give us an idea as to how many of those persons are female? And how many candidates, if you may, uh, Dutch, na um, well, naturalized Dutch. I can't answer that question. We, you know, from a voting bureau, bureau perspective, you know, we haven't done, you know, uh, calculations in terms of looking at the the makeup of, of the candidate list. For us, what's important, of course, is that a person is uh, is an eligible voter and that they have a kiesgerecht verklaring, as we say in Dutch, and that's all the information we also have of that person. So for me, it's impossible to see if they were naturalized or not. All I know is that they are Dutch and that they're eligible to vote. Um, we haven't uh, you know, done any comparison as to the, the makeup of the candidate lists. 
Um, but so, so off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to indicate how many female candidates are among the 129. Okay, uh, Ms. Snyders, um, in the interest of knowledge, can you give us a breakdown as to the many polling stations, you said 20 of them? Can you give us an idea as to the location of those polling stations? Thank you. We have 20 polling stations. So, polling station number one, John Lamoni Center, that's in Phillipsburg. We have Sundial School, also in Phillipsburg. We have St. Martin Senior Recreation Center, that's in Hope Estate. We have Sister Marie Laurent School, that is in Middle Region. We have Dutch Quarter Community Center, of course, Dutch Quarter. Milton Peters College, that is in St. Peters. We have our, you call the, um, it's, it's, it's falls on the St. Peters, um, Milton Peters College. Rupert Mayer um, Community Center is in St. Peters. Um, St. Martin Academy, also in the same district. Then we have Butte Hotel in the, um, Illich Road, beginning of Illich Road, Phillipsburg. We have NIPA, that is in Cahill. Hill. Charles Leopold Bell in Cole Bay. We have Leonard Connor School in K Bay. We have Simpson Bay Sport Community Center, that is number 13, that is in Simpson Bay. Number 14, Belvedere Community Center in Belvedere. Number 15, Melford Hazel's uh, Sport and Recreation Center. That is in, on Pontville and in Phillipsburg. We have Methodist Agogic Center, Max School, number 16 in St. John's. Then we have Dutch Quarter Community Help Desk. That's by Dr. Bryson in Dutch Quarter. That's number 17. Number 18, Seven Day Adventist School in Cole Bay. Then we have number 19, that we call House from Bavaring, the prison that is in Point Blanche. Number 20, St. Martin Home, that is also in St. John. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Tackling. Ms. Snyder, um, if I'm wrong, kindly correct me. You said uh, 350, uh, let me make sure you said 350, duplicates were made. Can you explain me the reason for duplicate? Um, if you have original cards that were supposed to be delivered, were delivered, what reason did the voter give um, that you had to make a duplicate? Because for me, if you have your original card and a voting card, for me, that's enough for fraud. So can you explain this part? I need to really get an explanation. And my next question, if you want to answer first, and then I can go to the police. Up to you. All right, so I'll wait for your answer for, for that. OK, thank you for that question. It's also a puzzle for me. <laughs> but you issue them. But you issue them. <laughs> yes, but we deliver them to the post office. So. The, I must say we had a lot of back and forth with the, the carts after we, we called community to come to the government building to collect the voting cards. They were a little bit hesitate to come to pick up. They said no, they wanted via the post. We gave them to the post office. They were distributed. However, persons come and say they never received the cards. So my question also is, where were the cards distributed? I believe it has to be distributed to the correct address. If it's to the correct address, that means that that person is not any longer to that address. And then they didn't go to the address to pick it up. So the, what they do, they come to civil registry, and we don't have it there, then 
we had a few persons said it was damaged because of rain, um, so we had to issue a duplicate. We have persons that says um, that they moved and they couldn't get to the, the landlord of the address, so they couldn't get it. Several, several um, information they gave him, but I, to come back to fraud, I don't think that that will cause a fraud in its, in my opinion, let me say it like that. Because we train, as Ms. Tecklin said, we trained all the 100 persons that will sit at the polling station. We didn't put friends and, and, and family together. We have five different persons. So we believe in the integrity of those five persons per polling station. When one person reach with an identification card and their voting card to the uh, um, chairperson of the voting bureau, polling station, that person controls the person and the voting card. Number two will control the, the kisses, what we call kisses register, the voting registry, and put a paraf, a signature, by the name of the person. So that person is checked off. That person cannot come twice to vote. So my question is where the fraud can happen to that in that setting. I'm not saying that fraud cannot happen with election. Don't take me wrong. I don't know where and I'm not, um, we, that's why we are here, all of us, to try to avoid those type of scenarios. But everybody has the right to get a voting card. By law, eight days prior to election, everyone has to get their voting card. And we did all of that on paper and also as manpower, we did it. However, somewhere, somehow, persons did not receive their voting cards. And that's why we're there tomorrow again for persons to collect their voting cards. And Thank you. if I may, Add, civil registry did, does not hire extra manpower to work at civil registry. So we have our regular work. On top of that, we work every day to accommodate person with voting. And of course, that is our main focus right now in these days. Thank you for the explanation. My question is for the chief of police. Um, uh, Carl John, Commissioner, can you explain me if you have a lack of manpower to be able to man all the polling stations as well as uh, uh, traffic activity on Thursday and all the other things police would have to deal with uh, on election day? Thanks for that question, uh, Bibi. Um, naturally, it's an exceptional situation when you have an election it's mostly already all hands on death. And with what I explained, that there's normal activity going on in St. Martin with uh, ships in port, et cetera, et cetera. Um, indeed, we have enough manpower, and the way we did this was that we will be supported by um, Curacao, Aruba, and the best. So um, Wednesday, 24 officers from these islands will be flown in. Will be also mainly used not at the polling stations. Um, we wanted to maintain our local officers at the polling stations. They know the community, they know how to deal with them. And the officers that we are bringing in are more for support for public order outside and uh, traffic situations, etc. cetera. Uh, did you get approval to keep your men in blue? for overtime in the event you need extra workers. Did you get the approval for overtime? Uh, CAP ESM always have uh, approval until a cap for overtime, so that's not an issue for the elections. Thank you. Good day to you all. Um, sorry? <laughs> okay. Um, good day to you all. Um, Police Chief Carl Jung, um, do you have an extra budget for overtime? 
Um, and the second, my second question is, uh, the current parliament has to approve the geloofsbrief for the credentials of the candidates. Um, knowing that there are several candidates that have a criminal record, is there is that any obstacle to enter parliament? And um, because, as I understand, the geloofsbrief have always, um, it's like a formality, they're not really reviewed, um, never, has it been an obstacle? Um, is there any in the process, election process, any other um, review of uh, criminal history or to go into parliament? Um, in our year planning, on, uh, when it regards to our budget, um, election 2024 is um, taken along. So there's really no extra budget needed. It's, uh, it's already opposed in our normal, regular budget. Thank you. To address the second question uh, regarding the geloofsbrieven, I think one, it's a, a complex legal question that's a little bit difficult to, to respond to broadly. Obviously, it really depends on, on the details, but I think um, looking at the geloofsbrieven themselves, it is somewhat of a formality and you can debate legally whether or not the parliament has a discretionary power in order to say that somebody may not enter into parliament. And I think that, that that's certainly a, a, a dangerous space if parliament were to say, we're not going to approve this person's credentials because at the end of the day, they're looking at eligibility to become a member, which is separate of course from any kind of uh, schakel you might have within the constitution that says that somebody is immediately suspended or something like that based on their record. So I think that you need to um, approach those from a different legal perspective. So in terms of the geloofsbrieven themselves, I, from my personal legal uh, opinion and, and reading of the law, I don't see much space there for parliament to be able to say no. And um, I think arguably if they were to, to decline a person that you could argue if there was and that the person could go to court because at the end of the day, they were validly chosen by the electorate, which is something separate again from um, the relevant uh, articles in our constitution, which then say something else. But again, those articles only kick in um, once a person is a member. You can't suspend somebody or kick them out of parliament unless they're, they become a member of parliament. So I think that, that you need to approach those differently. And again, it's a, a complex legal question that's difficult to, uh, to give you a cut and dry answer without, of course, all the case specific uh, facts. Um, just a follow up question to, uh, to that. Um, so you're saying only the once persons entered parliament, they can be suspended? From my reading of the, of the relevant article in the Constitution, yes, because it talks about the sourcing or, uh, or the verlies van lidmaatschap, which means that you have to be a member in order for that article to, to apply. But that would mean that the former member who just went to court, if he's, uh, conv he's convicted, that would mean he could be elected into parliament, but once he's in parliament, he can be suspended then immediately. From the reading of, of the law, you, you would be able to, to say yes. However, that's not a matter that, um, that has to do with the voting bureau, mm -hmm. um, but this is just kind of the, the general legal observation uh, where that's concerned. But I wanna be clear that this is not a matter for, for the voting bureau to respond to or, to or to have an answer to. Okay, thank you. Thank you for accommodating my second round of questions. <laughs> um, so I would like to ask, um, how soon after the polling stations close? Because I know counting happens continuously after that, but how soon do you anticipate that the public and the media would be able to get an indication as to who the, um, the uh, 15 MPs would be? That's my first question. And I haven't noticed any dummy ballots used this year. I know in the past um, it would be used to show persons how to vote. Will, we be, will you be using any voting ballots? I know we have just one day. <laughs> and what mechanisms will be put in place to ensure that no fraud is committed with the use of that. And my final clarification is for the police. There've been a lot of talk in the past days, um, allegations and accusations of vote buying. I would like to know, has any official report or been made to the police regarding vote buying? And if so, how many and how will that process take to address that? And um, also in line with that same question, um, 
I would also like to ask if there are any instances of vote buying detected on election day itself. How will that be addressed? And thank you so much again. For the results, if, thank you. For, um, the results, we will call in every hour to the Central Voting Bureau to give a count. The, after they finish count the, so the eight o'clock, they will call in and give a count of how much that goes via a turf list, of course, tallying. And at eight o'clock, the last result will be in from the tally and then from the counting of votes then it will start at 8. As soon as they are finished, before they leave the polling station, they will call and give that count as well to the Central Voting Bureau. And we, of course, with the training, you can talk and explain how everything has to be done. However, on the day itself and the amount of persons that cast their vote is how soon you will get all the information, but we hope, we hope, really hope that by midnight 12, all are in this year. So that is our goal for this election. Let's hope it will happen. Thank you. I asked about the dummy ballots as well as the reports of um, vote buying. Um. With regards to vote buying, the question was if we received any um, complaints thus far. Um, KPSM did not, but um, that does not mean that there were not complaints made. Um, with regards to vote, vote buying or fraud, uh, regards to the election, uh, the national detectives are specifically tasked with the investigative part of it. So KPSM can detect, but the process is that this, the investigative part of it is done by the national detective. Then indeed, the, you posed the question uh, regarding the dummy ballots. That's correct. That as of right now, we, we have not received any dummy ballots from the printer. Our, our focus has been very much on ensuring that we have properly printed ballots for election day and that we have the sufficient amount uh, required by law and that we have a buffer as well. So our focus has really been on that. And, um, and partially also because as a voting bureau, we have no legal obligation to uh, to provide a dummy ballot. We understand the, the purpose of it. And you know, I have had various discussions with, with parties you know, in discussions about them really needing or requiring the ballots a lot of times to, because you'd be surprised by you know how often people need assistance to understand how it is that they have to vote. Um, we're we're working to see if we can facilitate this, um, which you know it, it is a, a delicate balance as well because on, on the other end you know not having them in circulation could potentially combat fraud as well. Um, so you know we, we it's a difficult spot for us and we really do find it important that everybody is educated on how it is to vote. Um, DCOM uh, pushed out a video a couple days ago that's been circulating on social media. That's also um, the manner in which we do have an obligation as voting bureau to show the voter how to vote. Um, and that's been done by means of that um, communication video that's gone out and, and it kind of goes through the entire process of coming into the polling station and the ballot, et cetera. Um, on the day of elections, also within the polling stations, you know, they'll have the very big um, papers that people, that individuals can see um, how they how they can vote. So we're not at this point where we're trying to see if we can facilitate with dummy ballots in, in some form or the other, but we can't uh, guarantee right now that we'll have them in time. My last question, and uh, Chief of Police, um, as a follow-up to what my colleague asked you about vote buying and vote selling, 
Uh, yesterday, I believe it was, or, or early this morning, the prosecutor's office in the Lancashire sent out a press release cautioning persons about vote buying and the selling of votes. What mecha mechanisms are in place so that KPSM and your staff can use for detecting such? Because I'm sure the prosecutor's office and the Lancashire, will, they will not be at every polling station or a wrong polling station to see or to know how the, um, the vote buying and vote selling takes place. So what mechanisms were given to KPSM to detect such? I, I, I don't know if I can uh, fully agree with you that uh, the operational plans of the Lancer Shadisher and the public prosecutor, that they would not be around. So I, 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 I can't say that. Um, KPSM will use the normal methods that we have, and that goes as far as technology um, with the data collecting. Um, and I must be very keen on this. We have a lot of possibilities to do this sort of things, but mainly it's with um, the officers and the observations around the polling stations of activity that goes on and that they are very vigilant. Next to the officers that are supporting everyone who is in the polling stations, we have other officers also um, moving around in the community and different tasks are given to them. So for instance, we have our criminal intelligence agency that will be fully operational that day also. Mr. John, you may have seen the post on Facebook of uh, pictures of a few hundred dollars and uh, the text alleging that certain members of parliament would have uh, paid for, for votes. Is that in itself, is that reported to the national detectives? Is it something um, when you in incriminate someone through social media, is that something for police to uh, investigate? or have people come to the police station in person to file a complaint? Yes, as indicated, no one came to the police station to file a complaint. Secondly, um, I, I was very clear that the investigative part of food buying and fraud when it comes to election is a focus and a task of the national detectives. Um, I'm very sure that if something like this pops up on social media, um, it is something that will get attention, and if it has any merit, uh, they will do the investigation in that direction. I think also looking at the time, I don't know if there are any, does anybody have a final question that they would like to pose? Yep, go ahead. Um, just one last question. Um, can you give us an indication as to what general mechanisms are in place to ensure a free and fair and transparent election process, just in a nutshell. Thank you. Essentially, you know, and, and to answer that question, it's our electoral ordinance is built in such a way that if we observe the law and we adhere to everything that's in there, that it ensures that we have a transparent and free and open election process. And that's what all of us here at the table today are, are have been doing, and we've been ensuring that everything happens according according to law. You know, it's something as simple as, for example, uh, on the ballot itself, um, any direction that you fold the ballot in, um, it'll, it's, you see my signature along with a stamp from the Central Voting Bureau. So that being said, you know, if the, if within the polling stations, they, can, they should be able to immediately see if somebody is throwing a, a fake ballot into the box or anything like that. So that is one mechanism, for example, that ensures that it is a, a, a valid ballot. And, uh, and there's multiple things along the way, but essentially we're, if, if we adhere to the law and we make sure that everything happens in accordance with the electoral ordinance, that ensures in itself that we're having free and transparent and open elections. Then I'd like to thank you all again for joining us today. And uh, I hope everybody goes out on, uh, on Thursday and casts their vote. It's a democratic right that we've all fought very hard for, our, our ancestors have fought very hard for, and many people across the world wish that they could cast their vote in an electoral and a democratic process. So we look forward to everyone coming out on Thursday 
and also looking at KPSM, we really would like an orderly <laughs> and, uh, and, and transparent uh, process on Thursday. So thank you all again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing everybody at the polls on Thursday. Thank you.